Welcome everyone to another episode of Revolution Recap. I don't really need to explain the game. I don't need to go into a recap of what happened. If you're listening to this, you watched the game, you know exactly how this game ended. 95th minute, 1-1 game, Gustavo Bo sends the Revolution onto the next round against likely the Philadelphia Union. Uh, Nashville, as we were recording this, has a 2-0 lead, uh, which means the Revolution will be going back to the city of brotherly love down I-95 to try to get some revenge uh, on their kryptonite, the Philadelphia Union. But for tonight, the Revs advance 2-1 in a thrilling game against the Montreal Impact. I'm Greg Johnstone. Joining me today is Sean Donahue. Sean, how's it going? Greg, is this your first time doing a podcast after a Revolution playoff victory? <laughs> yes, it would be. This is our first podcast after a... I mean, I, I guess you did Revolution Recap back in the day um, before it stalled out. But yeah, this is our first... Since rebooting it three years ago, this is our first recap of a Rebs win in the playoffs. Am I wrong about that? No, I mean, I think since it might be the first Revolution Recap podcast since we haven't been a radio show and have been a podcast since that the Revolution actually have a playoff victory. So finally, some excitement in the postseason to talk about. I feel like every every time we end the year off a uh, a Revolution playoff loss and finally have a win to talk about. So a very exciting game from the Revolution, which I think it was unfortunate for them that they waited to the 95th minute to get the winner because, uh, you know, they played a, a very good game and just didn't get more. They should have more goals than they had, I think. Yeah, and and I texted you before the game and I said, you know, this is a game where Montreal is going to sit back. You know, they're missing some key players. They're going to try to slow this game down. And they really didn't. Montreal played a bit of an open game. They really tried hitting New England on the counterattack. And New England was uh, set up to attack uh, with their lineup. They they really had a lot of offensive weapons out there. So it was a really good back and forth game where at at times it was just end to end back and forth with the Revs, you know, getting the majority of the chances and ending up, you know, getting one more goal than than Montreal. But uh, it was certainly a thrilling game, which only saw three goals, but Really, we could have seen a lot more. So, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. First playoff win since 2014. Ironically, it was Terry Henry's last game as a player uh, back in 2014 when he was with the Red Bulls. So just to show how long it's been uh, since we have been celebrating a game. Uh, and, and back then, too, we obviously had New England soccer today, which uh, RIP. But we were still in our heyday uh, back then. So it, it, it's been a while. But, man, uh, does it feel great in the fashion which they won it is certainly uh, uh, certainly very satisfying. So, uh, Sean, give me your key takeaway from tonight's 2 1 win. Yeah, the, the, the big takeaway for me here is Gustavo Bo and Carles Heel finally back on the field looking pretty healthy. I think Carles Heel looked pretty close to 100%, and I think Gustavo Bo uh, looked about as close to 100% as we've seen him this season. I still don't think he's quite at what we saw from him last season, but Carles Heel, nine key passes in this one, 105 touches. And Gustavo Bo added another five key passes. Bo set up Carles Hill for his great opening shot. Bo set up Carles Hill a couple of times for a couple of different chances. Um, he put away that first one. And then Gustavo Bo scoring the game winner in the 95th minute. Uh, those two players you know, are, are the keys to the Revolution offense. And I think both of them really showed up tonight in a big way. Um, you know, you can look back at, you know, Gustavo Bo's eight shots, and he probably should have done better with some of them. Only one of them ended up on target, that one being the goal, obviously the biggest shot of the night. But, you know, I, I think there's still some rustiness there from from Gustavo Bo. But overall, the two of them look the sharpest they've looked all season. And that bodes very well for the Revolution going forward. Uh, because if the Revolution are to advance anywhere, you know, past the next round or in, into the next round, um, it's going to be because of those two on offense. You know, I think what the revolution saw today was was some very promising signs from the two of them. And part of that, too, was, you know, a change in formation from Bruce Arena that allowed the two of them to thrive. You know, we talked a lot last week about the weird 4-4-2 diamond that Bruce Arena tried against Philadelphia that really didn't make a whole lot of sense and didn't work. You know, this game, he went back to kind of a more traditional 4-5-1-ish formation that I think really allowed Gustavo Bo and, and, and Carles Heel to be a lot more in their comfort zone and play a lot better and, and even play off of Adam Buxa better than they did a week ago or a couple weeks ago. So there were some very promising signs for the revolution on offense in this one uh, and things that they can build off of offensively going forward. Uh, but it all goes back to those two guys in the end. If Gustavo Bo and Carles Heel are at their best, both of those guys are, are players that on their own can create shots out of nothing. Um, and when you get to playoffs like this, you need those big game players to turn up uh, and get those goals. And both of them did tonight. So, you know, a lot of money has been spent on those two guys and those two guys, when it mattered tonight, showed up. Um, and that's a great sign for the revolution going forward in these playoffs. Yeah. And Bruce Arena said something to that effect, you know, in the playoffs, you need your best players to be at their best. And yeah, they showed up. Certainly Carly's heel 
uh, showed up. I, I mean, he looks 100% in my mind. Obviously going the full game. Five shots tonight, three on target, two of them blocked. 87% pass accuracy, 73 for 84 passing. He was also 37 for 44 in the attacking third. Yeah, just an overall really, really great night from him. I don't have the number of key passes uh, but as uh, what was it? Nine key passes, you said, Sean, nine key passes for him and, and five key passes for Bo. A, a really solid game from Carly Hill. And you could just see, too, that whenever the Revs needed someone to, you know, when their offense stalled, they looked and they found Carly Hill. And, and I think that was really missing where previous when he wasn't on the field earlier this season, the team just looked lost and without a direction. They didn't have that person in, in the center of the field or, or, you know, basically looking for an outlet pass essentially to Carlos Hill. Um, now that he's there, you know, it, it just all comes together a lot better. And those nine key passes, I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot. Like sometimes we read a stat and it's like, ah, it doesn't feel that way. I mean, there were so many passes where Gustavo Bo was le- having, sending in through balls into the box. Uh, there was one pass that I thought was the best pass of the game. Carlos Hill is back basically at midfield. Does a nice long through ball. Gustavo Bo kind of runs back onside uh, at the last minute. Uh, and he slides it perfectly into him. And Bo just kind of taps it just barely wide of the net. Uh, so, yeah, Carlos Hill obviously is just a game changer. And, and the Revs looked amazing tonight uh gustavo bow eight shots only one of them on target obviously it was the one that mattered three shots uh were blocked but even he had a decent night passing as he said five key passes 25 for 30 uh pass accuracy that's 83 percent including 15 for 18 in the attacking third so overall a really really great night from both of them both of them um also want to get your thoughts sean before we we move on to my key takeaway on adam books's night uh, some people were kind of frustrated with him at points, but two sh- two really good shots uh, that hit the post's uh, header in the first half off of a corner kick, I think, uh, that hit the crossbar. And then the second half, he almost had a game winner, which kind of grazed the post. Um, what are your thoughts on Adam Buxa? Yeah, I think it was a mixed bag for Adam Buxa. I think he did some things really well. He had you know a couple of really close shots, you know, denied by the post, denied by some great saves. Um, his hold-up play was was okay at times in this game. Um, and he also had times where I think he was too indecisive. There was one play where Gustavo Bo uh, had a shot that was blocked and it fell to Adam Puxa. And rather than taking a one-time shot or even a, taking one touch and shooting, he tried to take a couple touches to get around a defender and get on his preferred foot um, and ended up wasting the chance. You know, overall, I think Adam Puxa had a, you know, a fairly good night. I don't think there can be too many complaints there. But, you know, my questions about Adam Buxa still kind of revolve around his his indecisiveness. Um, and, you know, I always thought when he'd scored a few goals, the confidence would, would be there and he'd be more quick on the trigger to, to get the shot off. But, uh, there, you know, it still happens too often where for a guy with, with his talent and his, you know, his caliber player, a good finisher like him, uh, you'd like to see more confidence. And when, you know, if, if a rebound comes to him in the box, from Gustavo Bo, like it did, uh, you'd like to see him take that shot one time. And that's that's the one thing that I think, you know, even as his game has gotten better for the revolution and even as he's become a, you know, a better part of their offense, um, you know, if he's really going to be that key player for the revolution up top, uh, he needs to be ready to pull the trigger in that situation rather than, you know, trying to dribble around guys. That's, that doesn't seem to be his game. You know, that might be Carly's heels game, um, but I don't think that's how Adam Buxa thrives in this offense. I think he's a guy that if he's in the box and he gets a chance to shoot, he needs to shoot. And that's what we haven't seen enough from him. There's just too much hesitancy there and too much indecisiveness when he gets in that situation. Yeah, it, the frustrating thing about Adam Buxa and, and the conclusion I'm kind of coming to as time goes on is that he does a lot of things good, very well except for score, uh, which is kind of his main purpose. (laughs) One play I want to bring your attention to is, I think it was in the 29th minute, there was a really nice play. It it leads up to uh, a Tayon left-footed shot. Buxa essentially has the ball outside of the box, does a really nice job holding up the ball, basically letting people make runs around him, and he finds Tayon perfectly, who sets up a nice left-footed shot, which probably you know also required a diving stop from Diop. Uh, but Adam Buxa is very, very good at hold-up play. He had another nice play where he chases the ball down the, the right flank. It was the Teal Bunbury missed shot. Scott Caldwell steals the ball, sends the ball up. I think to Gustavo Bo, who sends Buxa long into the, to the uh, right corner. Bo, uh, Buxa holds up the ball, waits, 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 perfectly slides the ball to Carly's heel, who then crosses the ball over into uh, Teal Bunbury. Adam Buxa is not the most impressive player on that play, but, you know, again, I mean, he, he has a lot of presence of mind to make the correct pass. Uh, so he, he does a lot of things holding up the ball and, and passing the ball well that I really like to see out of a nine. The problem is you're right. He, he s- still has moments where he just doesn't shoot when he needs to. Uh, 76th minute, uh, or no, sorry, 72nd minute, there's a play where Gustavo Bo loses the ball in the box. Where Gustavo, oh, you can make the argument Gustavo Bo could have fired uh, a little bit sooner, but Montreal 
tips the ball away from him, books a Klax, and instead of shooting when he has a, a bit of an open look, he kind of tries to dribble around and, and looks for that perfect opportunity to shoot, um, and, and Montreal dispossesses him as well. So we've seen it a little bit more and more, and maybe he'll, he'll get a little bit better in the offseason, his decision-making of when to pull that trigger, because he can shoot the ball. He's, he's a very talented forward. Uh, he's got a powerful foot. He just needs to pull the trigger when he gets a, a bit of a look. And, and it's kind of like how some people, you know, try to wait for that perfect pass and they end up turning the ball over. Adam Buxa is just looking for the perfect shot and he needs to realize that sometimes it's not always there. Yeah, I mean, Carlos Hill and Gustavo Bo are, are guys that are capable of dribbling around players to get that perfect shot. I don't think that's Adam Buxa's game. You know, we've seen him too often try to do something like that and then lose the ball. We, we've seen at times that he has a really good shot um, so I don't really get it. I, I thought it was a confidence thing, but you know, even after he scored a couple goals, we're still seeing it. And we've seen flashes from him that show he has that talent. Um, but I, I don't know why in a situation like that, um, for, you know, a striker, for a guy that's supposed to be your number nine, your DP striker, that he doesn't just pull the trigger and take the shot. And it's been a recurring theme for him this season where, you know, either he, he hesitates too long to take the shot or he hesitates too long to take the pass. And then the moment kind of passes him by and, and he loses it. You know, again, we've seen flashes where he scores some great goals, um, you know, with his head, with his feet. But the consistency of the decision making is just missing there. And I think that's something that, you know, he's capable of improving on. That's, you know, that's not something that at this point in his career you can't fix. I think it's certainly fixable. But I just thought we would have seen it kind of fixed by now. Adam Books, a 13 for 19 passing. That's 68%. He had three shots, all of them headers. He did not have a shot uh, with his feet today. All of them headers. Two of them were off the woodwork. One of them uh, was saved. So really all of them on target. So uh, a pretty productive night for him when he did get chances. Four ball recoveries, once dispossessed. Five for 10 on aerial duels. Um, I don't know if I said uh, attacking third passes, but he was six for... Six for 10 on um, attacking third passes tonight. So overall, I, I think a pretty good night for Adam Buxa. You just like to see the final result. And as I say, if if one of those balls that hit off the woodwork goes in, if it tips off the bottom of the bar and goes in or tips off the inside of the post and goes in, um, Adam Buchs is the player of the game. So uh, one person that I do think was close to player of the game, uh, if it wasn't for him being pulled off right after halftime uh, around the 50th minute, but Taeyeon Buchanan got his first start uh, at right back tonight. Uh, Sean, well, actually, this is my key takeaway. Taeyeon Buchanan was great at right back. We, we've been criticizing Bruce Arena's lineups and uh, kind of substitution patterns kind of going down the stretch. I love Taeyeon Buchanan at right back. I know a lot of people were a little curious about why this change was made, and certainly they were a little shorthanded at outside back tonight, but this is a game where the Revs were expected to be on the front foot, expected to push forward. Montreal is shorthanded, and even when they had their key players available against the Revs, the Revs kind of controlled most of the game, so Taeyeon Buchanan kind of played that attacking right back, and he did it really, really well. He's been causing a lot of problems for teams uh, along that right wing, um, and now you just kind of threw him in the mix with Carly's heel and Gustavo Bo. I mean, he, he was just an absolute wrecking, wrecking force today for the Revs. And um, I, I think if he plays a full 90 minutes, this game isn't close. You could tell the Revs kind of had the wind taken out of their sails after he came off in the 50th minute. But uh, I just positive marks for Taeyeon Buchanan all the way around tonight. Yeah, and I think people were asking us if you bench him after after last week or two weeks ago when he played in that bizarro, you know, four four two diamond as sort of a quasi winger central midfielder and didn't look very good, which I think was a product of the formation. But here he stepped into this this more conventional formation that the Revolution played and played right back, which is a position that we've never seen him play, um, and played it really really well. Now, do I think that you know if you're going up against Philly, that's going to work? Uh, maybe not. But you know, in a situation where the Revolution were going to be on the front foot. Um, and, you know, made a lot of sense to have Tejan Buchanan there, especially given the fact that, you know, Butner um, was presumably not avail available. Brandon Bay was you know, presumably not available. Sestinovic has been so bad that he's not even on Bruce Arena's radar. <laughs> um, but, you know, Tejan Buchanan looked looked really good in this game. And it was unfortunate for the revolution that he had to leave in the 49th minute with an injury. But uh, up until that, he barely set a foot wrong. 91 percent passing uh, two from him. We got off four crosses, one of which was on target. Um, you know, very, very good game. Who score had him at a 7.05, which I think put him at the uh, the fourth highest rated revolution player in the match, despite the the short stint. Um, so, you know, I, it's it's easy to say, well, you, you could say it was a master stroke from Bruce Arena to put him out there, although I think his hand was somewhat forced by by the shorthandedness. But Tejan Buchanan really, really stepped into that role and did extremely well. Again, I don't know that that works if you're going to play you know, Philadelphia and have him there, but certainly on a game when you're at home on the front foot, Buchanan did a, a great job. 
Yeah, and one thing that I was reminded of too is that I I, I remember back in the MLS's back tournament, Matt Doyle posted out a video where he has Brandon By and he talked about counter pressing and how Brandon By on the right side kept pushing up and kind of he he was kind of pinned up um, to kind of prevent Montreal from counter pressing. And, and Teon was kind of in that role tonight where he was pushing up and kind of helping lead the you know counter attack, getting turnovers and kind of pushing the ball forward. He was kind of in that counter pressing style that we saw Brandon By in the first matchup against Montreal. Actually, I guess the second matchup against Montreal this season in the MLS's back tournament. So um, it, it was just a, a role that really suited him well. And as you say, do we see that against Philadelphia? Probably not. Philadelphia is a much better team than Montreal. They're a much stronger team. They're going to be very well rested. Um, I, I imagine the defense is going to be a lot more tested tonight than, than Taylor Buchanan. Even tonight with the, you know, the Revs kind of controlling the majority of the game, I did not think the Revs were particularly sharp defensively. There were a couple of sloppy plays at the back. Montreal definitely was testing them with some long balls. There were some passes that weren't great. I know Kessler kind of uh, messed up a pass back to, to Turner that had to be cleared sloppily. Um, I know there was one long ball over the top for Andrew Farrell that he headed out for a corner uh, that, you know, almost got by, by Farrell. And, you know, when you're conceding corners, you know, set pieces are, seem to be a kryptonite of this team. So it's not exactly what you want to see. So I, I expect to see someone a little bit more experienced defensively in this game. I'm not sure who it's going to be just yet, but for tonight's game, uh, Taeyeon Buchanan did really well. Real quick uh, into his stat line, 20 for 22 passing, 91%. As he said, 5 for 5 in attacking third passing. Uh, one shot on target, which was that beautiful shot with his left foot, uh, which, by the way, if he can shoot with his left foot as well, I mean, whew. One for four on crosses, six ball recoveries in about 50 minutes. Sean, do you have any idea what the injury was? Someone asked us after the game if we have any idea. There was no update provided by Bruce Arena other than um, he was aware of an issue at halftime. Maybe it goes back to the foul that he suffered in the first half, which drew a yellow card. Uh, I'm not totally sure, but do, do you have any idea like from what exactly the injury is? Someone speculated it might be a knee injury. Do you know? No, I mean, I, I did see at one point in the game that he was limping a little bit, but I don't, I don't know what actually happened. Um, but it was very interesting in Canada to Bruce Arena after the game to say that, you know, he was aware of an injury at halftime. And he actually said if he was a better coach, he would have subbed him at halftime. So kind of interesting to see that hindsight from Bruce Arena on that one. Um, but no, I, I don't know exactly what happened. Hopefully we'll find out more as the week goes on. Uh, Bruce Arena certainly didn't reveal anything as to, to what the nature of the injury was. And I'll defend Bruce. I don't think you can take out uh, Taeyeon after that first half that he had. Um, I think you still got to run him out there and see if he can recover. And as they give him a few minutes, and if it's still not right, take him out. So, hey, Bruce, don't beat yourself too much. Uh, beat yourself up too much uh, over that one. Really quickly, Sean, let's get into the midfield pairing. Tonight we saw Matt Polster and Tommy McNamara there. No Scott Caldwell, even though Scott Caldwell had been favored, it seems like, uh, in, in recent weeks. Um, what did you think about the midfield pairing, and do you think that's who we see uh, against Philadelphia? Well, it's, it's funny. It's like a reverse of last season in which Scott Caldwell didn't play at all during the regular season. And then Scott Caldwell got put into the, the playoff lineup and to the shock of everybody in this game. Scott Caldwell seemed to be a favorite of Bruce Arena all season. And now all of a sudden in the playoffs, he gets benched. Um, so it's it's a, a little bit weird. Um, I thought it worked OK. You know, Tommy McNamara got that first half yellow card, which is a, a bit troubling for the position he's playing in, kind of puts you in a, at a bad spot. Um, I, I think he did OK. I don't think um, he had a, a particularly influential game for for Tommy McNamara. We, we've seen him do more in the past, and I think the Revolution offensively got better when Lee Wynn came on. Um, although, again, I think that's another move that, you know, if you're playing Philadelphia, you, you maybe can't can't do that. Matt Polster, I thought, was great. I thought he was fine. Um, I thought he had a pretty good game, um, and I thought he gave the, the, you know, the Revolution the opportunity late when they had to take off Tejan Buchanan to, you know, allow him the flexibility to move back to right back. I thought, he, you know, he overall had a, had a good game. You know, I think this this worked for the revolution, so I think we'll probably see it against Philadelphia. At the same time, if you were to swap out Tommy McNamara for for Kellen Rowe or Tommy McNamara for Scott Caldwell, um, you know, I, I think that works too. Um, I think it was more about the formation necessarily than than Tommy McNamara, and I think it was about Matt Polster, um, who I think had a had a good game. Um, again, this isn't a, a knock on Tommy McNamara. I think he was fine. I just don't think he you know necessarily had a, a particularly special game. He didn't stand out to me as someone that was you know particularly great. And I do think that early yellow card um, you know kind of hinders your ability to play that role in the way you want to play it. Yeah, and I, I thought Tommy McNamara played okay. I didn't think it was one of his best games. I, I think he was very meh. Um, some good, some bad. Matt, Pol Matt Polster, I thought was fine. Um, the one thing I, I want to add is that I'm curious if Matt Polster shifts to right back for next game, because, you know, it depends on what, whatever the status for um, Tay on Buchanan is, if he can't go, and, and we don't expect him to play it right back anyway. Uh, Brandon By has a right hip issue, I think they said. 
Um, so he might not be available. Uh, Matt Polster seems to be the next person in line. Maybe you can move Dewan Jones over to right back if um, Alexander Butner is back, but it seems like Poultner has been getting minutes more and more at right back lately, so I wonder if they go with a Rowe, McNamara, Caldwell pairing of some sort in the middle and shift Matt Polster to right back since he's a bit more of a defensive option. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that. I thought Polster was a lot better in the defensive midfield than he was at right back. Polster was serviceable there on on the right side, but um, he just doesn't have the speed. And I, I think the offensive capabilities is, you know, a Tayon Buchanan, a Brandon Bywater, et cetera, et cetera. But overall, Matt Polster's night, 60 for 65, 92% passing, uh, 13 for 15 in the attacking third, uh, two chances created uh, from Matt Polster. So a, a pretty good night overall. Of course, and, um, six ball recoveries, one time dispossessed, three interceptions, uh, three clearances. So pretty solid night for Matt Polster all the way around. We've been singing his praises for recent we praises for we, recent weeks. So I'm not totally sure how he played himself out of the lineup, but um, another guy that had injury concerns coming down the stretch and seems to be playing really, 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 really well when it matters most is Matt Polster. So you mentioned the fullbacks situation. In theory, this is why Sestanovic is on the roster for a situation like this where they have some fullback injuries. But I, I still think he's probably not going to be the choice next week, even if they have the same injury situation they do now and Tejan Buchanan's out, right? It, it, it seems like he's just buried on the depth chart. We He played 13 minutes all season, and that came in the last game of the year. Am I, am I crazy to think that, you know, even if Buchanan's out, Butner's out, and Bai's out, that we, we still probably don't see Sinovic? Yeah, I think Sinovic is a defensive replacement that maybe, and again, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the game where, you know, you text me and said, you know, what does this say about Seth Sinovic that D- uh, Dewan Jones is playing left back and Tayon Buchanan is playing right back? And, and my initial take for tonight's game is that, you know, if the Revs have a one-goal game lead, and those are your two outside backs. You're probably swapping one of them off and putting on Snovic, who's a little bit better defensively. Um, Snovic just doesn't add a whole ton offensively, I, I don't think. Then again, we haven't really seen him for a full year, so we don't know, you know, how good he is anymore. But regardless, yeah, I think he's a you know secure the victory, last minute, ten minute defensive, you know, minded type player. I'm not, I'm not totally sure what role we would see him in. Um, and I certainly don't think we'll see him start. I think we'll see Polster at right back and Dewan Jones at left back uh, if it comes down to it. I think I think Sinovic is the last option at, at outside back, um, which is kind of crazy. I could make the argument that we're going to see Tony De La May at center back and Andrew Farrell at right back before we see Seth Sinovic start uh, Tuesday at Philadelphia. So, well, well, hypothetically, a less disruptive way to fix your lineup when Tejan Buchanan got injured instead of taking your you know defensive midfielder and Matt Polster and moving to right back and then. Um, you know, having to put in a new defensive midfield, there would have been to put in Seth Sinovic and move, you know, Dewan Jones to the right. I think that would have, you know, in theory, that would have made more sense. But I, I, I again, I think that's another thing that just speaks to how far down the, the depth chart Seth Sinovic is. I thought, you know, in the offseason that it was a good pickup for the Revolution, some good left back depth. But, um, you know, we talked about it early on in the, in the preseason that he looked really poor in preseason and he's just been completely buried since then. It's, it's still surprising that he even got those 13 minutes in the last game of the season is only minutes this year, but you know, I, I, you know, if, if he's not coming in in that situation, um, I have a trouble seeing a situation in which he does come in. Well, and another reason that I think you put Sinovic in this game and you moved Juan Jones over to right and keep Polster in defensive midfield is that Polster was, as I say, pushing up on the right side and he, he did fine, but he was not as threatening as Tayon Buchanan or a Brandon by, he doesn't have Brandon by speed. Uh, I mean, Dewan Jones is a very fast pacey player who you want to see in attacking positions. And they were working the ball up the right with Tayon Buchanan most of the night. He, when we've seen Brandon by, they push a, you know, and, and Bootner on the left side, they've been pushing up by, and he seems like there's been more opportunities along that right side than there has been on the left. So in my mind, you'd want to put Sinovic kind of at left back, and move to Juan Jones and have him be the guy that keeps pushing up and keeps threatening uh, along that right side with um, Gustavo Bo and, and Carles Hill. Uh, and, and, you know, it was fine tonight, as I say, in the second. They, they kind of, once Montreal tied the game, New England had the majority of possession. And, you know, they were still very threatening, so it's it's not a really strong criticism. But just in my mind, it would make a lot more sense to keep Polster where he was in the midfield um, and playing very well and, and moving Dewan Jones over to that right side because he, he's just as strong a weapon as Tayon Buchanan in that role, I'd say. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, we've seen from Carlos Hill when he's kind of in that sort of right wingish role that he he plays really well off those speedy wingers, whether it's Brandon Byer or Dewan Jones. So, um, you know, it, it definitely seems to me like if if you had any faith in Seth Sinovic, that would have been the way to go. So, yeah, I think I think Seth Zovic is not, you know, it's clear all season that he's not high on Bruce, Bruce Arena's 
depth chart and that, you know, I don't think he'll be here next year. Um, but if, if they're in dire straits in the next game, I think it's, it's going to take a lot to get Sesanovic on the field. One more guy I want to talk about real quick before we head into Twitter questions is Teal Bunbury. Uh, three attempts for Teal Bunbury, one shot on target, one uh, off target, one shot blocked. Um, 26 for 29 passing, that's 90%, including 8 for 10 in the attacking third. Three ball recoveries, two dispossessed. Obviously, it's a bit marred because of a really, really bad miss uh, where he had a lot of time and some space to, to get a shot on target, and he curled it over the bar. Sean, give me your thoughts on Teal Bunbury tonight. Yeah, I think Teal Bunbury becomes more of an afterthought in the offense when you have Buxa, Carles Heel, and Gustavo Bo out there, and I think that was the case tonight. Um, you mentioned the misses, or the, the one miss in particular, that was just, you know, obviously very frustrating for him. Um, and, you know, and then he comes out of the game late for Rennix, which was an interesting sub. You know, I don't think he had a terrible game. I think he had his moments, but, you know, with... He's, he's been the revolution's leading goal scorer this year. Um, and he just, if he's playing out on the left wing with those other guys out there, he just becomes much less of a focal point for the revolution offense, which is unfortunate because he's had a really good year, but this, this wasn't his game. You know, he, he wasn't as heavily involved as he has been at times this season. He didn't have as many chances as he has this season. And the one chance that the one you know good chance that he did have, he, he flubbed. Um, you know, I don't think he was bad. He completed 90% of his passes. Um, the work rate was there defensively. Um, I think just inevitably when the revolution have, you know, their, their top offense out there, he becomes more of a role player, which, you know, I think is unfortunate for him because of how good he's been this season. Yeah. And it's weird to say that Teal Bunbury is an afterthought. He wins the golden boot and he's an afterthought, but this offense is just when all three designated players are as effective as they are. And you have Tayon Buchanan cutting into the middle. Teal Bunbury is a bit of an afterthought, but very frustrating that he gets that open shot, that one really, really big opportunity. I thought he was nailing it. Uh, he's been so reliable as of late and um, unfortunately curls the ball over the bar. Hopefully this is not a uh, cold, Teal Bunbury cold stretch um, because as Bruce Arena said, and as you said, Sean, you need your best players at their best during the playoffs. And he's certainly still a key player, even though he is, as you say, a bit of an afterthought when everyone is, uh, you know, healthy. Listener questions. You ready, Sean? Yep. All right, so first we got a question from David Sibillian. He says, if Taeyeon can't go the next game, do you put Jones or Bai at right back? So we kind of already touched on this one a little bit, but who who do you think, assuming everyone's healthy, why don't we give an answer to that? And then who do you think we will see again on Tuesday? Yeah, I mean, if Bai's healthy, I think you put him at right back and have Jones at left back. And there's so many question marks because, again, we don't know the situation with, with Bootner. We don't know if you know there's a chance he could be back. Um, you know, if Bootner is back, maybe you have him at left back and then, you know, Jones at right back. I, I have trouble kind of deciding which one of those options is better. I almost think if you're going up against Philadelphia, um, having that extra speed out there on both sides and having Jones and by as your fullbacks might be your best bet. Um, but you know, there are so many question marks. Let's hypothetically, let's say they're in the same situation here, um, where by and Butner are both unavailable. Uh, I, I, you know, Again, I think Sonovic is so far down the depth chart. I think you end up um, by default with Jones on the left and, and Matt Polster on the right. And I, and I don't think that's a great situation to be going into Philadelphia with. Um, but I think that's probably where you end up with. Uh, if everyone's healthy, I, I would go with Jones and buy. But that's that's a big if. There aren't many days between now and Tuesday. If Bootner is healthy, would you go with Bootner and buy, or would you still go with Dewan Jones? Dewan Jones played I, fine tonight, by the way. Yeah, I, I would. I would still go with Dewan Jones. I'd go with Dewan Jones and, and Brandon Buy. Uh, not, nothing against Bootner. Um, you know, if he's recovering from whatever he's recovering from and he's not hundred percent, that's even more reason not to start him. Uh, but I think, you know, having, having your speedy guys, um, at fullback could be helpful against Philadelphia. I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, I have trouble seeing a way that the revolution beat Philadelphia based on what we've seen this season. Um, uh, but if they're going to, I think they're better off having, you know, their, their speed at, at fullback instead of a, you know, a bootner that may not be a hundred percent. We haven't really talked about Dewan Jones tonight. He had the game-winning assist there in the, the final few minutes of the game, so I think we need to give him some credit, too. Um, right. <laughs> uh, we did get a question from John Bilkington. He says, so who had COVID? Despite the block shots, do you feel Buxa had a good game? And any word on Bai's injury and if he'll be back? So uh, we already answered uh, Adam Buxa, I'd say. We already kind of went into that a little bit, so I, I'm not going to – we don't need to rehash all of that. Um, we don't have any word on Brandon Bai's injury, and, in fact, we didn't even know about it until pregame. I'd say when he didn't make the 18, actually, I don't think we knew until really they, they mentioned it on the broadcast. Brandon by was not on the injury report. Um, and, and Bruce arena does not give a, a update in his uh, post game press conference. So um, we'll certainly monitor the Brandon by issue. I'm sure we'll get an update if 
Bruce Arena has media availability before the Philadelphia game, but as of right now, there is no idea what Brandon Buy's status is for, for Tuesday. And in terms of COVID, I feel like we can say it, right, Sean? I mean, I, I know we shouldn't really go into it, but FS1 pretty much announced on TV uh, if you were paying attention, who who has COVID? Do we want to go into it or no? I mean, I, we've kind of narrowed hate, it down regardless. I hate, hate to speculate, but through process of elimination, you know, if Brandon Bay is injured, if Diego Fagundes is at the stadium, um, who's the guy that's left out of your 18 that's not accounted for? And that's Bootner. Um, you know, I, again, we, we can't say with, with certainty, but, you know, process of elimination, I, th- I think that's the likely candidate, right? I, I mean, at one point, FS1 said um, Brandon Bay is out with a hip injury and Alexander Bootner is unavailable. And um, I, I don't know if the announcer midway through that sentence realized, you know, <laughs> what he was about to say. Uh, it, I mean, it just couldn't have been more obvious uh, that, you know, if you're aware that the Revs had a positive COVID test, as I say, he didn't say the quiet part out loud, but he solved the pu- puzzle for a lot of, of people uh, who knew what was going on. So. Um, I, I don't know. I know the positive test was last weekend, I think on Sunday. So he can't practice with the team, I think for at least what, seven to 10 days. So even if he is quote unquote available Tuesday night, he's probably out of practice. So I, I can't imagine we see Alexander Bootner on Tuesday against um, Philadelphia. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems unlikely, um, you know, Bruce Arena was asked about where Brent, where I think, uh, Bootner and Diego Fagunas were after the game and he said it was a coach's decision. He also wouldn't, you know, wouldn't answer the question and say who had, you know, no, but he wasn't asked directly who had COVID, but he was asked about Bootner and Fagundes and he just said it was coach's decision um, and that he hoped that they would be available Tuesday. But we do, at least from from photos that Diego Fagundes took at the stadium, it seems like he was at the stadium, which I don't think would be the case if it was him. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it seems unlikely to me, although I wouldn't say impossible that Bootner plays against Philadelphia, which is another reason why to me, if, you know, if by is healthy, um, you probably put by it right back and, and Jones at left back again. TSB 11 on discord says, are you going to suit up at right back on Tuesday? I think that we probably have more of a chance of getting into the game than Sesanovic does. Do you? <laughs> that, that, that might be the case. You know, I, I was a, uh, I was a right midfielder in my terrible soccer playing days, so I could probably pull it off. <laughs> and you you play defense for our college intramural soccer team. I was the keeper, so I wouldn't be much help at right back. I'm not an outfield player. I don't have the stamina. But maybe you can chip in uh, here and there, Sean, and, and put in a decent shift. I, I could probably give a good 30 seconds before I round a gas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I think we uh, would see, you know, maybe Colin Perfuth uh, give right back a shot before uh, you run out there. So James Downing says, what's up with Diego? Uh, and if he leaves, where does he go? Um little bit of context here. Uh, actually, uh, Seth McComer of the Bent Musket, friend of the program, had a great article on the Bent Musket. If you have not read it, please go do that. Uh, Seth Scoops over here uh, getting the inside sources. Um, basically says that the Revs have made a contract offer to Diego Fagundes, but Diego is also getting contract offers from, I believe, a Liga, a Liga, team, a Liga team, a Liga MX team, and another MLS team. Uh, so there is some interest in Diego Fagundes. It just seems like he's gone. Um, we talked about it in our last podcast, kind of at the end, that Diego's father was tweeting out things about Diego leaving uh, and being free uh, on December 31st. And Seth's article also confirms that Diego Fagundes will be a free agent at the end of the season. So it just seems like that um, there are some contract issues here. Uh, and it seems like Diego Fagundes is being frozen out of the 18. Sean, do you have anything to add out of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say his development has stalled in New England. Um, and I think the, the controversy we've seen from his dad and agent, Walter Fagundes, you know, we talked about it last week, his tweets. I don't think that's helping the matters for Diego. Um, and, you know, I, you know, it, it seems like a situation where he might be becoming a distraction. And, you know, I don't think it's necessarily Diego. I think it's his dad. Um, I'm not sure what it gains for Diego to have his dad out there, you know, tweeting these things out there. At the same time, I, I do think Diego's development stalled um, for the past several seasons for the revolution. And it would probably do him good to have a change of scenery and, and you know, go to Liga MX. I, I can't really see him going to La Liga and, and getting regular time. But um, Liga MX is a very good league, you know. I think probably inarguably better than MLS at the moment, or at least historically better than MLS. Um, and, and maybe the style there will, will suit him a little bit better. Um, but I think he needs to go somewhere else to continue to develop his game because I, I think whether it's gotten too comfortable, whatever it is, he he hasn't shown the progress in New England, um, you know, over the past few years that you'd like to have seen from him. Uh, so I think it, it probably makes the most sense for both parties to move on, which is, you know, a tough thing to say given Diego's, um, you know, tied for the record for appearances for the revolution has been such a key part of the revolution over the years. Um, and, you know, for so long and at such a young age. 
Um, and, you know, you know, hopefully in the future, there's an opportunity for him to come back to the Revs. But uh, it sounds like based on what his dad said that, you know, he's on the way out and it, it's, it's hard to see him coming back here. With, with that said, um, as Seth pointed out in his article, he's made those comments before and then Diego came back. But those were different situations where the Revs, you know, had contract options and, and things like that. And that is not the case anymore. So um, very curious to see what happens in the offseason. But I think this time is for real that he's not coming back to the revolution. We should note that there were talks of him leaving two years ago. There was links to him in Uruguay uh, where he wanted to go on loan or whatever that story was, uh, where he, he was being connected elsewhere. And it seemed like two years ago under Brad Friedel, he wanted to leave. And, you know, we talk about his development stalling. I mean, if you have a disgruntled player and, you know, I mean, take out, take sports out of it. If you hate your job, you know, it's going to impact your performance. You know what I mean? Uh, so if Diego Fagundes has been wanting to leave for two years, he probably wants to go develop as a player elsewhere. And it's probably just best for both sides to move on from this, um, you know, as I say, forced marriage. I, I think it's good that, that Diego is leaving. And I don't know if you saw this, but Seth tweeted out right before the game that Diego Fagundes was, was healthy and, and able to play. And it was a coach's decision uh, to, to you know, not, not put him in the 18. Uh, and Diego's dad actually replied to that and said, yeah, Diego's fine. Diego's dad also tweeted out this morning at 916, ha ha, what a big surprise for today, ha ha, they would have to tell the truth, um, and I don't know what that means in, in terms of, I don't know if that's in relation to Seth's article, or if they just got word that Diego was not going to be available tonight, uh, if that was the quote unquote big surprise, but it, it just seems like this is now getting public that they don't enjoy this uh, meeting, and I, I don't think Bruce Arena is going to be putting Diego Fagundes in the 18 for the rest of the for the rest of the playoffs. I think we've seen Diego's at least first tenure with the Revs come to a very uh, unsatisfying conclusion and a very unfortunate end. And I don't know, really sucks. It really sucks to see a, uh, I'd say club legend go out like this, but you know, hopefully Diego picks it up somewhere else. Well, and we should note he's one of the the rare young MLS players eligible for free agency because he's been in the league so long with the revolution. So he could go somewhere else in MLS for free too, potentially. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there, but there aren't many guys his age eligible for MLS free agency. The second part of this question was, if he leaves, where does he go? Um, do you have any guesses, Sean? I, I don't think he stays in MLS. I, I think he might enjoy going somewhere else, maybe Liga MX, uh, you know, maybe La Liga for a very bad team. You know, I could see him being on a team that fights relegation. I don't know. I, you know, I, I can't see him being with a top tier team uh, in La Liga, but where do you think he ends up uh, if he ends up leaving New England? I mean, I think it would be a mistake for him to go to La Liga. I don't, think he's good enough right now to to you know get regular playing time on the Liga and I think he needs to be somewhere where he's going to play I, you know I could see him in Liga MX I'm sure there's a, a team down there that he could help um, again Liga MX is a really high standard to play um, you know we, we see consistently they beat MLS teams and you know the CONCACAF Champions League it's proven to be a better league than MLS you know uh, even as MLS has made mid strides to catch up um, and I'm, I'm sure he, he can find a team there that he can contribute to and, and, you know, maybe his style of play will fit in better there. Um, you know, I also wouldn't be shocked if he went to another team in MLS. I'm sure there's other teams in MLS that would be interested in him. He's a guy that has a lot of talents and, you know, what last year he was making what, 209,000 or something. He's, he's not that highly paid. So, you know, hypothetically, if another team in MLS and, you know, with the free agency rules limit how much more you can give a player, you know, maybe he does end up in another MLS team that, that wouldn't shock me. Again, I, I know we've heard rumors that, you know, Seth, Seth's article mentioned a La Liga team. Um, I don't know where that came from. I don't know if that's his dad trying to trying to pump him up. But, you know, maybe that's more of a, a bluster and to try to build interest. But that that would surprise me. But Liga MX or, or another MLS team wouldn't shock me, um, you know, off the top of my head. I don't have a, a team name in mind, but uh, both of those seems like realistic options. Uh, and, and one other thing, too, before we move on from Diego's dad, as we should mention, we talked about this last week. Um, Diego's dad tweeted out, I think, a few weeks ago. And this, this tweet didn't really make its way around Rev's Twitter. Uh, a few of his tweets did, but one of them didn't. Uh, it, it was the tweet about how it seemed to imply that the Revs weren't going to play Diego Fagundes to break the appearances record unless he signed a new contract. And Diego did not come in uh, in the final game. He's, he's uh, frozen out of the 18 after this game. So kind of an interesting subplot. I'm not sure what to believe exactly. Um, but, you know, as I say, a little bit of drama here uh, towards the end of the season. And, and for what it's worth, Diego was at the game. Um, him and his dad did seem to want to cheer on the Revs, uh, but obviously a lot of tension between the two parties. The Revs had a photo after the game where uh, they had the whole squad. And, uh, you know, if you haven't seen this tweet, Matt Turner is cropped in because I guess he was DJing right now as everyone was posing the photo. 
Um, and they said, you know, the whole team's here. And Alexander Butner is missing for obvious reasons that we already went into. Um, and Diego Fagundes is missing. And Brandon Bay and, and Jeff Caldwell and some other players who were not in the 18 were in the photo, but Diego Fagundes was not in the photo, at least from what I could see. Kind of an interesting uh, tension behind the scenes that is uh, not going to get any better, I would say, before Diego's contract runs out. So it'll be interesting to see where he uh, ends up. Like we got the we got the two high profile father son agency situations with Lionel Messi looking for a new club and Diego Fagundes looking for a new club. So he's he's in good company in the uh, the father agent role. <laughs> Is uh, Lamella Ball's dad his agent too? I mean, he went number three to Charlotte. Uh, so I mean, we got all sorts of father son agencies going on right now. Very 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 vocal fathers as agents. <laughs> Really excited. I got a Lamar Ball uh, reference on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> James Downing also asks us, half, hats off to Terry Henry's impact, which, by the way, I think we got to give a lot of credit to them. They were not expected to be in this game at all. The Revs were a minus 290 favorite, uh, and they really fought today. So a lot of respect for Montreal today. But um, anyway, James Downing says he felt for them, uh, and Diop especially. He says, am I overreacting and saying that this was the best Revs game I've seen in a long time and that the first half was as good as I've ever seen this team play? Um, not sure about the first half comment because they've certainly had some really, really good first halves um, in the past few years. But I would say this is the best Revs game since our last playoff win in 2014. Uh, Sean, I'll, I'll let you add on to that. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't I wouldn't put it in an ever category for anything. I think they're, you know, 15 years ago, the Revs team played a lot better. Um, but yeah, if we're talking about this year. Um, yeah, I think it was a very good performance overall from the revolution. Um, and again, I think, like you said, Montreal deserves a lot of credit. They didn't have a good situation here. Um, you know, Victor Winyama was unavailable because of his international travel. There was even some talk this week that he might be available. So that probably didn't help the preparation. Um, uh, Piet was unavailable due to a red card. Uh, I don't know where Max Rudy was. He, he, you know, wasn't in the 18 either. I don't, I didn't hear why he wasn't there, but he's been a guy that's had some success against the Revs in the past. Um, so they were missing a lot of key guys and, and Thierry Henry went out there and, and didn't bunker in, you know, he, he tried to play, uh, with some offense out there and, you know, credit to Montreal for going into a very difficult situation and, and doing all right. It was kind of funny listening to the comments this week from them that almost, you know, sounded defeated in a little ways. I think it was Henri that talked about how the, you know, the revolution had their number and he's like, but now they have their, all their designated players available too. <laughs> so um, you know, credit to Montreal for making a game of it. But the Revolution did play really well. This was a good performance from them. Um, and I think, you know, you, you could argue probably their best performance of the year um, and, and, you know, best performance maybe since their last playoff win. I don't know. I'd have to, have to think about that one longer. Um, but, you know, a lot of that's because Carles Heel and Gustavo Bo were a lot closer to 100 percent than we've seen them in a really long time. And and just going back to Bo really quickly, I know we talked about a lot a lot earlier, you know, take those missed shots out of there. Uh, the sharpness on the shooting wasn't there, but the the runs from Gustavo Bo and his combinations with Carles Heel uh, were there and, you know, looked like kind of vintage Gustavo Bo, even if, you know, the shooting and again, he, he scored the game winner. So you can't you know, trash him too much for that. He, um, the, the seven other shots maybe weren't his best, um, but, you know, those two guys and the way they played made this a really good performance from the revolution. Yeah, and as I say, if you give Gustavo Bo eight shots, I'm pretty confident one of them goes in. So it's just a matter of time that if you give Gustavo Bo Even a little bit of off. space, yeah, he, he's going to find one of them eventually. So MJ says, uh, love the amazing Galazzo. Having said that, Books' indecision will end up costing us and let us hope that, uh, uh, sorry, different thought, and let us hope that we are not moving into a keel uh, Teal cold streak for scoring. Teal cannot miss those easy ones like he did. Uh, so agreeing with some comments we made earlier today. Nashville, Nashville up three nothing by the way. So I think it's uh, a pretty safe bet that uh, the Revs are playing Philly. <laughs> yeah, down to Philly we go. Actually, I don't know if Philadelphia still lets fans in, but maybe I'm going to be making a trip down to Chester. I'm 20 minutes away, so I might be going to that. Well, I'll we'll see. COVID, I'm probably not going to that. Um, my my, my wife's a nurse. She won't let me. <laughs> probably not worth it. <laughs> um, James Downing says uh, also hats off to Henry's uh, Terry Henry's assessment of arena as the Sir Alex Ferguson of MLS uh, I appreciate Henry's respect for the history of the league and interesting Re Revs fan fiction subplot note Boyan and Bo exchange jerseys post games uh, post game so uh, yeah some interesting notes there by uh, James I will say Terry Henry certainly and, and Bruce Arena certainly seem to have a lot of respect for one another uh, and it, it's kind of been interesting to see all week uh, David Sibillian asked us one more question too why are the Revs so bad at set pieces? Um, seems like a question we're bringing up all the time. And Seth McComer had a stat at the beginning of the game that the Revs had conceded eight times this season on set pieces. That went to nine 
uh, tonight. That's 35% of the total goals the Revs have given up all season long. Matt Doyle said a few weeks ago that the Revs are really good at defending from open play, but they are terrible at set pieces. So this seems to be an ongoing problem. Sean, any idea why the Revs are so bad at this? At, at this point, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, they were bad under Brad Friedel. Um, they've been bad under Bruce Arena. I thought they would have fixed it by now. Um, you know, again, adding a guy like Henry Kessler, who put some height in your back line, I thought would have helped. Um, but, you know, he was partially at fault for the goal today with a, you know, n- not a great clearance um, off of that set piece. So I don't know what the answer is to the revolution on set pieces. I'm sure, you know, Bruce Arena is well aware of the fact that they struggle on set pieces. So if he hasn't been able to fix it in practice, I don't know what's going to fix it. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. I Going back to that goal, I try. I, I, granted, I've only seen this two or three times. I don't know who to blame for that one. Sometimes they look completely, you know, disorganized and confused. Um, and I don't know what the total number of corner kicks from Montreal was tonight, but they seem to have a, a few free kicks. And on corners, they they seemed pretty tight and and, and um, well done. This free kick, I mean, Henry Kessler looks like he stumbles a little bit, loses the aerial duel, and then I couldn't tell whose person is lost, but this person's not in the box. You know, I, I had a tough time finding a single person to completely blame for this goal. Um, so tonight, I I, Farrell falls over on the play too at some point. Yeah. It, it, and the free kick was from straight on goal. So maybe it's just the way they were running. Cause they were essentially trying to run straight back. Um, so I'm not, I'm not totally sure if there was something just with the angle of the play or I'm not totally sure, but it seemed like this was a little bit more fluky than normal. Um, some set pieces, they just look completely out of whack and there's wide open people all over the place. Um, this just seemed like a, an attacker was kind of trailing off of a header. Um, and, and I mean, it was still challenged too. I think Andrew Farrell gets up and challenges it. Uh, he's just not in as good a a position to block the shot. Yeah, it, it, it is a, it's a very, I think there's a lot of blame to go around and maybe not necessarily, um, you know, one, one player that you can call out for, for the mistakes, um, again, Kessler in the in the post game conference took some of the blame on himself for not getting more of a head to that initial ball and getting it out. Um, but you know, it, it's you know it'd be easy to write this off as a one off if it hadn't happened so many times this season. Um, and it's something that the Revolution are gonna have to really really tighten up on against Philadelphia because the the margin for error against Philadelphia is a lot less than it is against Montreal as we've seen all season. Yeah, they'll certainly have to be sharp, and I'm sure Philadelphia knows that set pieces are the way to go against uh, the uh, New England Revolution. Uh, hey, Sean, I got one more person to talk about that we should have put at the beginning of the episode, but I kind of forgot about Justin Reddick's made an appearance, huh? What do you think of that? Uh, yeah, the Revs 2 star, Justin Reddick, got back into the first team. If you if you, if you you asked me who was going to appear in this game, he would have been, um, you know, maybe below Seth Sinovic on my list of guys that I thought were going to get into this game. Um, so that was, that was kind of shocking that in a situation where the revolution, it wasn't, you know, cleanup minutes, the revolution were uh, in a tie game um, with, with five minutes to go in regulation and Justin Rennicks came on for Teal Bunbury. Uh, that was pretty shocking to me. I did not expect that Bruce Arena is good for, um, you know, it seems like he's good for a few surprises in the playoffs. Um, but he hadn't appeared for the revolution first team, uh, since a four minute appearance against Philadelphia back on August 20th. Um, I did not see this one coming. Um, I don't think he necessarily did anything you know, wrong in this game. I don't think he had that much of an impact. Um, but that, that was kind of the, sh- <laughs> the shock of the game to me that he came on. He's kind of taken over the role that I think Diego would have played in terms of the, you know, replacement winger late in the game, especially with Tayon Buchanan playing it right back. Well, and, and Mana was on the bench. <laughs> yeah, I was a little surprised to see Manning not come in either. That seems to be a role that you would expect him to come in at. But um, Renix did have four goals in eight games, I think. I think that's right. I think that's what Seth tweeted out. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But uh, he did have a fairly successful season at Revs 2. He was one of the subs coming off the bench at the beginning of the season. So despite 29 minutes in four games for the Revs in 2020, Revs 1 in 2020, I think Bruce Arena has some faith in Justin Renix and getting some pretty critical minutes there at the death. So... Pretty interesting to see him come off, and it'll be interesting if he is again, if his number is again called against Philadelphia. I do think we'll see if Teo McCann is on the bench. I think he obviously comes in over Justin Rennix, and I think they like Justin Rennix kind of in that winger role, kind of to replace a, a Teal Bunbury type of player instead of a, you know, number nine where he replaces Adam Buxa. But that that there was a lot of shockers tonight, and Justin Rennix coming on was one of them. Hey, hey, who's higher on the left back death chart, uh, Kellen Rowe or Sesnovic? Oh, Kellen Rowe. I thought you were going to say Justin Rennicks, and I was going to have to think about it. 
poor Seth Sinovic. What did he, he did not deserve this. He seems like a nice, he's got, he's been dealing with a wrist injury all year. We shouldn't make fun of him. Uh, I mean, it was it was supposed to be the great comeback season for Seth Sinovic after the revolution cut him so many years ago, and then he went on to have a great career, and it just hasn't panned out. Not exactly the return that uh, Seth Sinovic was expecting. Probably not ex- the, really the the return Kellen Rowe was expecting either, since he's fallen out of form and we did not see him again tonight. But as you say, maybe there's a, a nice spot at left back for Kellen Rowe next game. Sean, we do have one more person with some contract news that we should talk about. Carly is heel. Um, I guess Charlie Davies said on Extra Time Radio yesterday, uh, or this week, I, I don't know when the episode came out. I guess it was Thursday, so it's yesterday as we're recording it. It'll be two days ago if you're listening to this tomorrow on Saturday. Um, but either way, Charlie Davies came out and essentially said that Carly is heel has, you know, enjoys New England, thinks he could spend the rest of his career here, uh, which is good because his contract is up at the end of the season. Uh, this conflicts with reports at the time of his signing that said it was a two-year deal with two one-year options back in, in 2019 when he signed. Carlos Hill was also asked by a Spanish-speaking reporter earlier in the week at a media availability, so I don't know if it was an international reporter or not, but he was asked about his contract, and Carlos Hill said he approached the revolution about it, and he's already had discussions with it, but right now the focus is on the playoffs. So... There is some talk about the contract. I'm not sure. I can't imagine Charlie Davies has his information wrong. So I imagine that the contract is up at the end of the year, but it seems like there's mutual interest in renewing it. Um, Are you freaking out about this? Because I certainly was not expecting this to be an issue come November. Yeah, I mean, I I thought he had at least one option year left. Um, And I'm still not 100% certain that's not the case. Although, you know, what Charlie Davies said would contradict that. But yeah, no, that's that's a huge question for the revolution. Um, you know, it, it, to, you hate to say it, but it honestly might work in their favor uh, if they're trying to resign him that he's been injured so much this year. I think, you know, if he had another season like last year, um, I think there'd be lots of opportunities knocking on his door. But the, the injury plague season this year um, might work against that. But again, yeah, if, if he's gone next year, you know, you're looking at a completely different revolution team where, you, you know, you have to find a, a whole other solution on, on how to run this offense. Um, and, and I think you're going to have an upset David Pasternak, who was uh, commenting on Carlos Heel's great goal earlier in this game. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting the Pasternak reference either. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, one thing that I thought was interesting was there's an article from, I think, The Independent, uh, a UK publication that was talking about Heel's time in, in MLS. And I thought the timing of that was weird. That seemed like a puff piece. Like, you know, I'm wondering if his agent is trying to bring attention to how successful he's been in MLS and is trying to drum up maybe interest overseas. Now, you know, it is a pandemic. I'm sure not a lot of teams in Europe are spending. We've had this same conversation about Matt Turner. Um, If now is exactly, you know, if now is the right time for teams to be buying and if they're going to do that. And as you say, Carlos Hill is coming off of a pretty big injury, although he seems to be 100%. So um, I'm curious to see what the Revs do. And if I was Carlos Hill, I'd... I don't know if I'd go year to year, um, but he's certainly MLS best 11. Um, he's a designated player, so he can get as much as he wants, really. Um, I, I, if he is getting a new contract, I certainly expect a pretty hefty raise. Uh, and he's still pretty young overall. And, and as you say, this team is really nothing without him, as we saw all year, even with Bo and Buxa. Uh, I mean, it would be it's going to be really, really hard to replace Carlisle Seal. So, um, yeah, I'm sure the revolution will open up the checkbook. There's no restraints since he's a designated player. He'd still be on a designated player contract. I cannot imagine uh, Bruce Arena and, and Kurt Nolfo and uh, Robert Kraft are going to be this isn't going to be a Jermaine Jones scenario where they're they're you know offering him a pay cut and kind of expecting him to leave. Um, probably similar to what they're doing with Diego Fagundes. They're probably offering him a hundred thousand dollars instead of you know his current pay of two hundred thousand. I imagine that Carlos Hill is going to give them a number and they will offer something maybe slightly lower. But I mean they they have to resign him. There's no other alternative. I have no. I'm I'm pretty concerned about it. But the Reds would be very stupid to find a way to lose him. Yeah, I mean, what we had heard before was that he had two option years after this year. So it's it's kind of shocking news if it is true. And, and sometimes, I, you know, you you wonder if it's, you know, misinformation. I know we've there's been times in the past where I think there's been foreign players and foreign agents that haven't fully understood the the MLS option system. Um, so giving the benefit of the doubt that maybe maybe that's the situation here. But, um, you know, if he is truly his contract is up at the end of this year, uh, you know, he is a must keep 
for the revolution. He's the best player on this team. Um, he's irreplaceable. I don't think you find another Carlos heel in the off season if he's gone. So, you know, if you're, if you're Bob Kraft and Carlos heel is interested in staying here, you have to find a contract that works to keep him with the revolution because he's just such a big part of this team. Um, I don't see how the revolution could possibly replace him. Sean, one more note before we go. The Revs announced their year-end awards. Um, Henry Kessler earns Defender of the Year in his rookie season. Matt Turner gets his first team MVP. Teal Bunbury, Humanitarian of the Year. Um, also, Matt Turner was named the Players' Player of the Year. Uh, and also, Teal Bunbury was obviously the Golden Boot, uh, which you know expected. Also, Matt Turner, nominated for Goalkeeper of the Year, became in second place to Andre Blake. Um, do you have any issues with these awards? Any complaints? What are your thoughts on them? I mean, I think the Revolution Awards were no-brainer. Uh, Matt Turner, clearly the MVP this year, especially given you know how many injuries there have been to guys like Carlos Hill, Gustavo Bo, and those guys. Uh, I don't think there's any question on that one. Henry Kessler, clearly the Defender of the Year. I don't think there was any competition there. Unfortunate for him, they got rid of the MLS Rookie of the Year, so he couldn't win that this season because I think he was a clear favorite for that as well if they hadn't gotten rid of that at the last minute you know all those people complaining about supporters shield perhaps perhaps not being awarded at some point you know they went back and revoked that uh, i think it's also unfair to henry kessler that towards the end of the season they decided there wasn't going to be a rookie of the year but uh that's that's a not neither here nor there um you know if if matt turner wasn't going to win goalkeeper of the year uh Henri blake was the other deserving candidate so disappointing matt turner didn't get it i think he was very deserving um, but I don't think you can have too many qualms about Andre Blake getting it. I mean, we, as you know, watching the revolution, we've seen what Andre Blake can do. We've seen Andre Blake have huge games against the revolution. He's a fantastic goalkeeper. Those are the best two goalkeepers in the league. Yes, it would have been nice for Matt Turner to get it, but uh, Andre Blake was also deserving. Yeah, when you're the best player on the best team in the league, or I should say the, the Supporter Shield winner, I mean, you're, you're probably going to get the nod. Yeah, you're, you're probably going to get the nod. On, uh, on a goalkeeper of the year. I think a lot of people were pointing out that the margin was a little steep, 44% to 12%. I don't think the, the difference in quality between Blake and Turner is that crazy, but I think Blake was just the obvious choice for, for a goalkeeper of the year. And I think Matt Turner still getting more than 10% of the vote uh, just kind of shows what a leap he has made. The players' share of the vote was still pretty disappointing overall. Um, I think he's got like 6%. I think he was tied for third in the players' vote. So I thought that was a, a bit interesting and... and I don't know, maybe uh, actual players just feel he's a little overhyped, or may maybe there are some players in the Western Conference or something like that that just haven't played him, and I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. But, you know, Matt Turner has been pretty consistent over the last three years. I think if he stays in MLS for two or three more years, um, you, you know, he's kind of shown he's not a fluke whatsoever. I I'm sure he's going to win MLS Goalkeeper of the Year one of these years. He's going to be in the run running every single year, and I think that if the Revs played a little bit better, if they were a one or a two seed in the East, we'd be talking about Matt Turner as Goalkeeper of the Year as opposed to Andre Blake, but I, I can't really complain too much. Andre Blake had a phenomenal season. He was nominated for uh, MLS MVP, uh, so when you, you you get, you know, if you're a goalkeeper and you get nominated for MVP, you're, you're obviously going to win Goalkeeper of the Year, so um, no real complaints with that, and no real complaints with the Revs Awards um, either. I thought all of them were well-deserved overall, so... If the Revs could defend set pieces, Matt Turner probably would have been goalkeeper of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Turner still almost made that uh, save on the set piece tonight. That was really impressive. And he had a really, he didn't get credit for this. He had a really nice save on a Matt Polster near own goal. So yes. uh, Matt, Matt Turner was not expected to be called in, uh, in as much as he was, but came up really, really big today for the Revs. Sean, before we wrap up, any final thoughts here? Did anything happen with Tottenham this week? I didn't give you your Tottenham 20 seconds. No, international break. So uh, nothing until tomorrow when they got the big game against Manchester City. You want to give us a prediction? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always nervous when they go up against Manchester City, but Tottenham has been the better team this year. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say uh, three to two Spurs. Should be an exciting game either way. All right. I'm betting on the Spurs. And if they lose, I will be complaining to you. And I will not let you hear the end of it. I just want to point out a couple things uh, before we ended up going. Obviously, there's the team forfeiting over COVID rule, which I think is stupid. Uh, we're short on time. So I'm just going to say it's really stupid. MLS didn't do a bubble. There's not going to be a lot of fans in stands anyway. Even the fans that are allowed in stands, they're not going to be allowed in stands in two weeks. Really, really stupid. I don't know why I didn't just do a bubble. Would have worked out perfectly fine. But whatever. I'll, you know, whatever. The Super Draft, they've ended up getting rid of the fourth round, which was... You know, we like the Super Draft. I love the Super Draft. It's really exciting. I think as a fan, just the whole draft format is great. But in MLS, it's really struggling. Uh, and if you follow the, the Super Draft, you know that the fourth round is essentially just teams passing because they don't have room for four rookies on their the bottom of their roster. So um, I would have liked to have seen a way for Super Draft picks to maybe, you know, find a way to put them in USL or, or find them, you know, 
find ways to be inside an MLS organization, but develop over time, something like that. But instead, they ended up getting rid of the fourth round. So, you know, just a minor thing there. Uh, and then also Houston Dynamo did their rebrand as Houston Dynamo FC. They have a very generic logo. Um, and another team has caved to adding FC to the end of their name. Uh, and I'm disgusted. I'm tired of it. It's pretty shitty. So Houston Dynamo FC. I mean, the Dynamo <laughs> ripping off you know, Russian soccer was was bad enough. And now adding the FC. Oh, come on. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned the, the COVID situation and the fact that the MLS didn't do a bubble. I, I, I think it also is warrants a, a quick mention that how ridiculous it is that in the middle of a pandemic that's spiking, um, they sent all these players off to play international soccer games. I love international soccer. You know, nothing gets me more excited than a World Cup. Um, but to play international soccer games in the middle of a pandemic and have all these guys that, you know, these leagues were doing relatively well to contain COVID and there haven't been too many outbreaks. Um, but now all of these guys, and you've seen it, it's not just an MLS, you know, in the Premier League, a, a lot more players have gotten COVID uh, because of these international breaks. And it's, it's extremely problematic and it's something that should have been avoided. Um, but to go into the MLS playoffs now, and, you know, I'm watching Nashville get uh, I'm watching Nashville rip Miami to shreds while Miami doesn't have the Higuain brothers. Um, you know, they're missing other guys due to COVID. And then, you know, it's it's extremely disappointing to have an MLS playoffs that's missing Gonzalo Higuain due to COVID. It's missing Carlos Vela uh, now due to COVID as well. Um, you know, so many big, huge names that are, the you know, the stars of MLS out because these guys went and traveled to play international soccer games and, and caught COVID. It just makes no sense. It's stupid. Um, I, I It's very short-sighted. You know, again, I was very happy to see um, the you know the future of the U.S. national team. So many young guys play a U.S. national team game, two U.S. two a U.S. national team games this week. Uh, but it wasn't worth it. It didn't make any sense. Um, MLS should have been in a bubble, and there shouldn't have been these international soccer games. Um, you know, I think they got a little too cocky because of how well they've been doing and how you know few outbreaks there have been. Um, but with things peaking, none of that made any sense. I mean, I get LAFC is a seven seed and Miami is a ten seed, but how how are we viewing this MLS Cup playoffs as legitimate? I mean, let's say there was an outbreak in the Philadelphia Union locker room. Let's say let's say this weekend, you know, three Union players test positive for COVID, and the game still goes on, and the Revs advance. I don't want to win that way. That's that's terrible. I mean, you, there's a you know, in that scenario, the supporter shield winner loses a one eight game because of COVID. And while we would be the benefactor, I don't, I don't think we would, you know, if it's, you know, Brandon Aronson and Bedoya and Andre Blake missing the game, you know, it, it would be great. I'm excited that there is advance, but I, I certainly don't feel any better about it. And I certainly think there's an asterisk uh, to whoever wins MLS cup. Yeah, I think there absolutely is. But, you know, again, LAFC haven't had a great season, but you know, them, for example, um, they're such a great team. They've had injuries all year. Um, they were finally getting healthy with, you know, guys like Carlos Vela coming back uh, towards the end of the year. And they could have been, they should have been a threat in the playoffs. But now with, you know, Brian Rodriguez, Carlos Vela, I think um, Diego Rossi is out as well. You know, it's, it's, it's really disappointing um, to, to be in a situation where you're going into the playoffs and, you know, the big stars that you want to see. Um, I think everyone wants to see those big names get out there on the field aren't going to be playing. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I think it's, you know, at the end of the at the end of the season with all these guys out, it's hard not to look it's gonna be hard anyways, but it's it's hard not to kind of think of the the end of this year with a, a bit of an asterisk when you crown that MLS champion. And I'm sure players didn't want to go back into a bubble, but you know, when you have TFC playing in Hartford and, you know, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, MLB did the bubble, NBA did the bubble. It seemed like the bubble was working, and this would only be for a few weeks. This isn't going to be as long as the MLS's back tournament. So uh, I'm really confused with this decision. I think they're playing with fire here. I think cases are going to get worse over the next few weeks. It's hard to conclude that it's going to be any different, and, you, and it's already impacting multiple teams across MLS. So hopefully, you know, players remain safe. Uh, hopefully, they may remain quarantined while, while you know, being at home. But uh, it's certainly very concerning and these playoffs are not off to a good start. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me correct myself. I think it's not Carlos, Carlos Vela that's out. It's Diego Rossi and Brian Rodriguez are other two designated players. I think Carlos Vela is, is okay. I think, I, I think Vela uh, is the only designated yeah. player that isn't impacted. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think it's Diego Rossi who's, you know, been their top scorer and, uh, Brian, and Brian Rodriguez has also been key for them. So e either way, it's a severely weakened 
LAFC team, um, a severely weakened Miami inter Miami team that's getting crushed by Nashville right now. And, you know, I think never really had a chance, um, you know, missing, you know, Gonzalo Iguain, Frederico Iguain, um, and at least one other player. So it's just really, really disappointing that this had to happen. And, you know, it, it happened because of the international soccer break, largely because of the international soccer break, um, which just, you know, doesn't make any sense. Uh, that they're doing that right now of all times. Um, and especially, you know, when things are getting a little bit more hopeful, it, it does look like a vaccine is coming soon. Um, you know, hold off a few more months if you can, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, I'm worried about the NFL season, and um, I'm hoping MLS can wrap this season up before things get too, too bad. And as I say, we're already starting to see a few outbreaks. We're lucky for the Revs that, you know, it only was – Alexander Butner allegedly, but not really allegedly. We all know, but um, you know, we're, we're it's good that it only was one player at this point, and um, hopefully it doesn't you know become more of an issue. And and I'm shocked that Wanyama was even you know I think Montreal was trying to negotiate with the league to bring Wanyama into the squad. I cannot believe that 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 was even a remote consideration after all of the players tested positive for Miami and LAFC. So anyway, congrats to Nashville for their first playoff win with their asterisk. Sean, you didn't have any uh, super draft takes there? No, I mean, it, it, I think we all saw it coming. The fourth round was becoming the the uh, pass round. The third round has even been the pass round for some teams. Um, and it's also a logical follow on to getting rid of rookie of the year is putting even less emphasis on the super draft. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, even though I think Henry Kessler did a, an interview with Six States One Pod, which we recommend if you haven't listened to it yet, please go back and listen to it. Um, but they were at, they asked if he was disappointed about that award going away and you could kind of, I think he said he, it, it made sense, but the real disappointment came into when they announced it. Cause it was a little over two weeks ago. Um, this decision should have been made two years ago. Really. If you, you think about the award and, uh, how people are shift, the teams are shifting away from the super draft. Um, so yeah, I, I, I understandably disappointment, disappointment for Henry Kessler, not getting nominated for rookie of the year. Um, although I think Daryl DK would have won it anyway, but, um, yeah, super draft, um, still have three rounds of it still will be fun, but, I I don't know if it's going to be around in five years. So, uh, Sean, where can people find you on social media? I think I think the super draft might have, end up being one round in the not too distant future. Um, and you can find me at Sean L. Donahue. And you can follow us at Revolution Recap on Twitter. And also, please like our Revolution Recap Facebook page. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you are listening. We always appreciate uh, new ratings and new reviews. Next game, Revs go down to Philadelphia on Tuesday. As we mentioned, we will be doing a podcast Tuesday night, so please send us your questions. Uh, send us your listener questions and comments and reactions after that game. We also have an email, revolutionrecap at gmail.com. So if you are not on Twitter, if you are not on Facebook, but you do have a question for us after the game, we will be taking all questions You know, after each podcast for the rest. Uh, we'll be doing a podcast after each game for the rest of the season. So uh, you can also send us an email if you would like. Yeah, we'll be back Tuesday. Go Rebs.